can't stop forgetting my God that you never left you right here with me till I'm convinced you're hiding oh God would you remind me you're still just as good as when I met you you're still just as kind don't let me forget that you're still the same God let me through the fire you're still the same God separates the waters come do what only you can do God I need you saying a little howdy, um, but that was kind of weak, I'm going to be honest. So we're going to try that again. I know it's early, uh, but we got a lot of things to talk about, and I want you guys to be excited for it. So 
Howdy! That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Well, hey, for those of you um, that don't know me, my name is Tyler Olsey. Uh, I graduated from BCS in 2021 uh, and now am a sophomore communications major at the Texas A&M University. Hey, 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 hey. Um, if you know me, that's funny because I'm like the biggest super center there is. So for me to be doing that, that's great. Um, Man, I'm so blessed to consider myself deeply rooted uh, in spirit-filled community as a member of my home church uh, at Citizens Church in downtown Bryan. Uh, I serve with an on-campus Bible study at Texas A&M called, uh, called Breakaway Ministries, um, and there I serve as uh, like a broadcast engineer. I love getting to lead God's people in worship um, and have been blessed to see the Lord's faithfulness uh, in the opportunities he has given me as I lean into the calling he has over my life. I am what most people consider a contract worship musician, uh, which sounds all fancy and whatnot, but what, mo- uh, what really means is that I get to partner with churches um, that are in need of worship leaders to lead their congregation in atmospheres of worship. It is a great way for me to be able um, to help churches of all kinds in creating real and radical houses of worship. And man, what a privilege it is um, to be the Lord's partner in directing the stirred affections of the bride, which is us, the Big C Capital Church. Um, stirred affections catalyzed by the Holy Spirit um, to the groom, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is made possible only by the Spirit that is inside of me, guiding my every step as I humbly attempt to lead God people in a holy roar of praise unto the Lord. So, you may be asking yourself, okay, hold up, Tyler. This is about the fifth or sixth time you've mentioned the Holy Spirit thus far, and we're only about two minutes in. Um, And so what are you trying to say to us? Well, I'm so glad you asked me, guys. It's so great. Um, If you have your Bibles with you, uh, I would love for you to turn with me um, to Romans chapter 8. That's where we're going to be deeply rooted, uh, deeply rooting ourselves this morning. Romans chapter 8. After Acts, yes, before Corinthians. That's great. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind, all right, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Bless you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Let us pray real quick. Yes, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, um, Lord, just for the day um, that you've given. Lord, this is the day that you have made. Let us just be rejoicing uh, and be glad in it. So we thank you just for the opportunity we have um, 
at this school to draw near to you. Um, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity we have. Uh, yeah, what a privilege it is to come to a school where we can openly talk um, about the word of the Lord and about how he's moving in our lives, how the spirit is moving in our lives, and how we can have those conversations with our faculty and staff. Like, we, we must not take for granted the privilege that that is. Um, so we thank you for that. Lord, would you speak through me this morning? Um, would you just bless the words that I have to say? And Lord, would you speak um, to each of the students here? Um, yeah, and would you just, would, you, would, would your words through me be impactful for them? And would they just go away today learning a little bit more about you um, and your spirit? So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So who is this Holy Ghost you speak of? Is this a distant relative of Casper, the friendly ghost? Isn't the Holy Spirit just a uh, personification, some sort of like metaphysical explanation of how our hearts, our hearts are convicted and stirred once we accept Jesus uh, as our Lord and Savior? Or isn't the Holy Spirit just like that one person that shows up to family reunions and nobody really knows them, but everybody's too afraid to ask like how you're actually related to any of us? Um, or are we at a place where we do know the Holy Spirit is, but we leave it at just that? Or maybe like, yes, Tyler. I know of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of where I was in high school. I knew of the Holy Spirit. I learned a lot about the Holy Spirit through, through the Bible classes and, and just kind of growing up in the Word um, and growing in a Christian household. Like, I knew of the Holy Spirit. Um, but have I truly ever experienced an empowering of the Holy Spirit? Has there ever actually been a time in my life where I have experienced a real life-changing filling of the Holy Spirit that is God? Friends, these are all extremely valid questions that you may have asked yourself before. I know I have, really. Well, maybe not the Casper-friendly ghost one, um, but the others have been genuine thoughts and convictions of mine, and that is good. Questions are good. Struggle is good. Conviction is good. And who is the one who convicts? Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 8, when he who is the Holy Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, he will prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. That is conviction, my friends. The Holy Spirit convicts. But do we leave the Holy Spirit to just convict? Absolutely not. To do that would to deny the power and the presence of the Lord in our lives. And without the power and the presence of the living and breathing God in our lives, we are thoroughly unequipped for the calling commission the Lord has for us. Not just that, but without the Spirit, we are actually unable to please God. Bold statement, Tyler. I know. But look at me at Romans 8.8. 8. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So thankfully, we who have put our faith in Christ have been baptized with the Spirit, as Paul states in the following verse. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, and if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does, ha does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even through your, though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So yes, we who declare with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and therefore the Spirit that is God dwells inside of us. Praise God. But we need to be careful in our language here. Baptism by the Spirit is different from a filling of the Spirit. Yes, there are people who are convicted by the Spirit of sin. Yes, it is the Spirit who convicts unbelievers of sin, as Jesus says in John 16. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong in, about sin. And those people who have radical transformations and intuit accepting of Jesus Christ as Lord can both be baptized, can be both baptized by the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit. But a true filling of the Holy Spirit upon receiving salvation is not promised. So do not hear me wrong, friends. We who accept Jesus into our hearts do, in fact, receive the Holy Spirit. But are we filled? Not glass half full, but filled. I love, I love the Oxford de definition of filled. It states that filled is becoming an overwhelming presence in. A pungent smell of garlic filled the air, for example. So we are baptized with the Holy Spirit upon salvation. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are filled with the Spirit of God. Now, there is a belief 
common in Pentecostal churches that is referred to as the second blessing. And I just want to clarify that that is not what I'm talking about. Um, For those of you who aren't aware, the meaning of the second blessing is rooted in the Pentecostal doctrine of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is described variously as the crucial blessing to be sought, the ultimate experience to strive for, and the greatest achievement of the Christian. According to Pentecostals, the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. The Assemblies of God website says, All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience of all in the early church. They further teach that this experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of the new birth. So I tell you guys, I don't believe in the second blessing. I do believe in a second blessing, but I also believe in a third blessing, a fourth blessing, a fifth blessing, a sixth, a seventh, and so on, as long as we are alive on this earth. We must be a people who are constantly filled with the Holy Spirit and are therefore renewed and repeatedly empowered by the Spirit over our lives to do all the Lord has called us to. And when we walk in the Lord's calling over our lives, we do this not only in in obedience, but also because that's our actual desire when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at me, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So this is so important right here, friends. A mind governed by the flesh will desire what the flesh desires. And a mind governed by the Spirit will desire what the Spirit desires. So how do we know when our minds are governed by the flesh and when they are governed by the Spirit? Well, I'm so glad you asked again. Our good friend Paul, um, who we're going to be reading a lot from because he talks a lot about the Holy Spirit, uh, gave us a clear example in Galatians 5. So if you would turn in your Bibles real quickly, Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and Romans 8 are going to be our two main passages for this morning. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul says right here at the beginning, friends, the acts of the flesh are obvious. It should be obvious when our minds are governed by the desires of the flesh. The question should not be, are we walking in the desires of the flesh Because we know when we are walking in the desires of the flesh because they are obvious. Rather, our question should be, how do we walk in the desires of the Spirit? Well, let's go a couple verses back to verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The law here in reference uh, is the old covenant before the eternal cleansing Jesus achieved through his death and resurrection. But notice here Paul's claim that the flesh and spirit are in conflict with each other. We must do away with our idea of the personifications of spirituality. Spiritual warfare is real and it is constantly around us and is even happening inside of us as I speak right now. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. If we do not acknowledge the works of the Spirit in our lives, how are we to ever press into what the Spirit is moving us to? Friends, we must be aware of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives and in the lives around us. So, how do we see the Spirit at work? What are the fruits of the Spirit at work in us? You guys know this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. These are the fruits, guys. That wasn't obvious. These are the fruits of the Spirit. We see these constantly in our lives, do we not? These are not fruits of the flesh. Nothing defined here by Paul can be a desire of the flesh. As he says, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So then we must say that the fruits defined here in our lives must be from the spirit. This is our fuel gauge of the spirit. When we see the fruits in ourselves, and I mean actual fruits of the spirit, guys, it's easy to say we bear fruits in the easy seasons uh, when life is going our way, but do we bear these fruits when we are faced with hatred Despair, turmoil, ugliness, selfishness, deceit, harshness, and indulgence. These are the fruits of the anti-spirit. Vegetables of the spirit, if you will. Desires of the flesh. When we are surrounded by these evils, do we still see ourselves walking in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Or do we find ourselves walking in the anti-fruits, the vegetables of the spirit? This is the indication of a true filling of the Spirit, friends. When we walk in the Spirit and when we are seeing the fruits of the Spirit even in the rough seasons, okay? We saw in verse 25 and 26, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Notice how he doesn't say, let's just follow or walk with the Spirit, but to keep in step. He says, living by the Spirit involves keeping in step with the Spirit. It involves adjusting our pace to match the pace and direction the Spirit is leading. It's like allowing one's partner to lead in a dance. In other words, uh, sorry, in other words, it involves submitting to God's way, but we are still the one taking each next step. So this will not happen automatically. It is something we must choose from day to day. In fact, we must often choose to give the lead to the Holy Spirit moment by moment as we follow after Christ. So, clearly, we are to walk in the Spirit, but what is the practicality to that? How is that we truly walk in the Spirit? What does it look like for us to truly have the Spirit guiding us in our walk through life? We can't simply just say, okay, Holy Spirit, have your way. Come and do what you want to do. We're just going to sit here while you just, I guess, take over our bodies or whatever that is. No, that's not the way, guys. Um, We are not called to be apathetic and passive children of God. Apathy is one of the most dangerous traits as Christians we can indulge in. It's deceitful and can trick us into thinking we are being righteous in our lowliness. False humility, false devotion, false reverence, and false faith. Romans 12.9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Notice all of the verbs here. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. These are all action verbs, friends. So we are not called to an apathetic, passive Christian life, but we are called to be bold um, in our faith. We are not called to submit to the the Spirit and be silent. Rather, we are called to submit to the Spirit and be bold proclaimers of the gospel, as it is our calling from Jesus, where he says, Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, as I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's Jesus right there. He says it. There it again. The promise of the Holy Spirit. And we are equipped to share the gospel through the Holy Spirit and by our own testimonies of the faith. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, not of the letter, but of the spirit. 
for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Further along, it is written, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveil, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, you're probably like, Ty, I need to take notes here, and you're just saying a lot of scriptures, yada, yada. Hey, scripture is great, by the way. I would love um, for my talk just to be straight from scriptures, but I'm trying to apply it a little bit here. So, bear with me here. Our first practical step to walking with the Spirit is to walk with the Spirit of freedom and of service. Okay, you write that down. Our first practical step to walking with the Spirit is to walk with the Spirit of freedom and of service. Galatians 5, 13 through 14, a little few verses back, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse. Sorry, that's the wrong one. My bad. Uh, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. It is by the Spirit we walk in freedom, not to indulge in the flesh, but to humbly serve one another in love. 1 John four eleven through 12 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God lives in us, and his love is made a completeness. What does that sound like, guys? What does that sound like? The Holy Spirit, guys. Holy Spirit. God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We must love one another, for love comes from God. If we do not love others, we quite literally reject the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us. The greatest gift of all time given to us, and we reject it. That must not be the case, my friends. We must love others so that the Spirit of the Lord may continue to do a work in us and through us. So, point number one of walking the Spirit is to walk with the Spirit of freedom and of service. Point number two, we are to walk in a spirit of prayer and intercession. Paul writes to the Ephesians, this is a famous verse, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We must be a people who are devoted um, to praying all the time. In the morning, in the evening, in our joy, or in our sufferings. All occasions, Paul says. Not some occasions, not just when you need it, not just before meals. We have to discipline ourselves to pray to our Father at all times, with others and by ourselves. We also must be a people who pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. Big requests, small requests. Guys, nothing is too little or too big um, for our God, right? So why are we afraid to present our requests to God? He cares for us. He is our Father. Romans 8, 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. With this information, guys, why are we so afraid to ask and to pray and to have conversations with our Father? Yes, He is our Heavenly Father. But Paul's word. So what's holding us back? Those left when you declared Jesus is Lord and by the Holy Spirit into your life. So what's holding us back? Maybe we just don't know how to pray. Maybe we just don't know how to pray. Yeah? Well, who better to teach us how to pray than the one who devoted himself to praying to his father, his actual father, his father in heaven, but also his father. Jesus says in Matthew 6, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's that simple, my friends. We don't need to be a people afraid of what prayer looks like or even how to pray. For Jesus has given us the greatest resource to pray. Right here, guys. Right here. He gives it right here. And pray God for that, yeah? So we walk in the spirit of prayer. And we also walk in the spirit of intercession. A spirit of intercession. If you don't know what that means, guys, intercession is simply praying on another's behalf. Romans 8, 26 through 27, again, says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through worldless groans. Any who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. If the Spirit intercedes for God's people, then we ought to as well. There is so much beauty in interceding alongside the Holy Spirit. We should strive to be a people who intercede for one another. Intercede for our friends, our family, our school, our city, our nation, our church, the church, and all nations. Interceding together is a beautiful thing, friends. When we gather together in intercession, it aligns our hearts with one another before God. Our hearts are fixed on interceding for certain people and people groups. If it is the Lord's will that every nation, tribe, people, and tongue confess that he is Lord, then shouldn't we be a people who at least pray for that? That is, in fact, the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. If that's so, then the least we can do is intercede and intercede on behalf of those people. Or do we not believe in the power of prayer? If we are people who don't believe in the power of prayer, then we must also be a people who don't believe in the power of God. Why do you think Paul always begins and ends each letter with a request of prayer? If he knew it meant nothing, he would not have asked. No, Paul believed in the power of prayer and he urged those he was writing to to believe as well. And that is my urge to you. I urge you, friends, you students here in this room, even the faculty, to devote yourselves to praying in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. So we pray in the spirit. We pray in a spirit of prayer, and we pray in a spirit of intercession. My last point in how to walk in the spirit is this. Write this down. We walk with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We walk with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We must devote ourselves not only in prayer, but also in the word of life. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Ever wondered what it means by God-breathed? Well, guess what? I have an answer for you. The breath of God is the spirit of God. John 20, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The breath of Jesus literally filled his disciples with the Holy Spirit. I hope this gives you a better understanding of who this Holy Spirit is, an actual person. He is the breath of God. And through his work in the writers of the scriptures, just like how he is teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness through our hearts, through the work of the Holy Spirit, if that wasn't enough, he wrote it down for us in this holy text we call the Bible. So friends, we have two resources right there. It's like redundancy, guys. You know what redundancy is? It's like repeating the same thing over and over again. The Bible does it all the time. Paul does it all the time. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And so, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he is teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training us in righteousness. But he also has given us the word that he breathed. This is inspired scripture by God, by the Holy Spirit. He breathed uh, those words into the writers of the scriptures. And so he also is teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness through the scriptures. He wrote it down for us. Ephesians six seventeen says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
Every great soldier takes his greatest weapon into battle. If King Arthur's greatest weapon truly was a scalibur, it would be crazy for him to go weaponless or even with something such as a mace or crossbow. No. In the same way, we should always be on the front of the battle lines of life with our greatest weapon, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The Word of God. And when you bring the Word and the Spirit into the equation, you start to see the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Just like if you wanted to understand any book there is, your greatest resource would be the original author. Right, guys? If I wanted to understand more on the story uh, of Harry Potter, for instance, the first person that I, I, I would at least want to talk to is J.K. Rowling. Unfortunately, there are some obvious obstacles that make it practically impossible for me to do so. All the more, then, is the reason we should be studying the Word with the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Unlimited access to the, to the author and perfecter of our faith. Right, guys? My prayer and hope is that you guys would see the power in that. What a privilege it is that we have access to the word that gives life and be able to know the mind of God through the Holy Spirit. Now, Tyler, hold up a second. You're telling me that we can actually know the thoughts of God? Well, no, we cannot know the thoughts of God, but we do have the Spirit of God that lives inside of us who does know. Paul writes in the first letter to the Corinthians in chapters, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, the Spirit searching all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who knows the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. With the culmination of all these things, my friends, we find ourselves thoroughly equipped to do every good work that God has called us to and to walk according to his purpose in our lives. So it is with three, these three steps that we can practically walk in the Spirit. I'll say it again. We walk with a spirit of freedom and of service. We walk with a spirit of freedom and of service. And we walk with a spirit of prayer and intercession. Prayer and intercession. And lastly, we walk with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So I'm going to pray for us real quick. Uh, this is from um, Ephesians this is Paul writing uh, to the Ephesians, and I just really want to pray this um, over you guys real quick. So if you just bow your heads with me. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at working with us. To him be the glory and in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. So guys, I just want to take a second, all eyes closed, heads bowed. I just want to take a second for us to respond, to respond that all um, that God is speaking to us. So we're going to do this thing that I love to do when I'm praying. We're going to hold out our hands in front of us, everybody. If you have something, set it down. No excuses. Hands out. We are posturing ourselves before the Lord to receive all that he has for us. This is one practical, easy way for us to do it. Sometimes we get confused with what's physical, with what's emotional, and what's spiritual. So in that, we just posture ourselves, even in the physical, before the Lord. We're going to ask a few things. One, 
let's ask the Holy Spirit to come fill our hearts. Right now in your seat, ask the Holy Spirit to come fill your heart. And the second to that, guys, I talked about intercession. We are going to ask the Holy Spirit to come fill the hearts of those sitting to your left and to your right. And I want you to use specific names. If you know who's sitting to your left and who's sitting to your right, I want you to pray for them specifically with their name, that the Holy Spirit would come fill their heart. we should ask the Holy Spirit to show us the will of the Father. Show us the will of the Father. Ask the Holy Spirit right now to show us the will of the Father. Father, not my will, but your will be done. So now we ask that the Father's will would be done. Will we continue to be made known what is the will of the Father, but then would we actually do the will of the Father? Pray that right now. Next, let's ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts believers of unrighteousness. It is not out of shame or out of guilt, but it is encouragement through conviction that the Holy Spirit convicts us of unrighteousness. So we just ask that the Holy Spirit right now in this room would convict us of unrighteousness. Pray that right now. We ask the Father that one, we would be a people who radically pursue Him. Ask the Father right now. Pray that we would be a people who radically pursue Him. This is prayers for yourself and interceding for others. Would be would we be a student body who radically pursues the Lord? Pray that right now. through that radical pursuance of our Heavenly Father. May we ask that the Father, um, that we would be a people who boldly declare the gospel here, even now, at this school. And whatever we're doing, whether it's here, whether it's outside of school, would we boldly declare the gospel? Would we not just assume that somebody knows who, what the gospel is? Will we never make that assumption in life, but may we just be eager and willing to share the gospel. So will we ask the Holy Spirit that he would help us in boldly declaring the gospel? Pray that right now. Yes, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We continually ask, continually, that you would fill us up. Holy Spirit, that you would move in our lives and that you would convict us of unrighteousness and that in, in turn we would then be radical pursuers of you and boldly declare the gospel. Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you for Brad's Christian. I just thank you uh, for all the students and faculty here today. I pray that our school, um, man, that we would look like just a body of believers 
who radically pursue you and boldly declare the gospel. Spirit, you are moving in this space. You are moving in our hearts. May you continue to do that here. Lord, bless this school. Bless these students. Father, we honor you. We worship you. We love you. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen.